Good morning, everyone. Beautiful, cool summer morning, right? I love this kind of weather, although a little more warmth for the service would be nice, but God's good, and we're thankful that we can gather like this outdoors on a summer day. Miss Pastor Phil, he's up, uh, he's up there on Lake Superior where he can get warmer weather. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but anyway, so this morning as we uh, gather, we've been making this study through Ephesians. We've got a little ways to go yet. And one of the things that occurred to us along the way is just a little backstory, backing up just a moment. The last several series that we've done, Phil put together a, a team of guys to help him plan sermon series. And so uh, they gathered, our three pastors and a couple of other of the elders gather with Phil and help to break down the books. And so when, when we laid out Ephesians, um, we, we, the sermons you're hearing, that was laid out by a team. Here's, here's what we'll preach. And, uh, but we left an extra week in there and, and uh, I was assigned a, a different text for today. And then uh, Phil, as he was thinking about this, he said, you know, we've got an extra week in our series. How about if you do one on spiritual warfare? Because it shows up fairly prominently in the book of Ephesians. And it's like, okay, that makes sense. And so I shifted to the subject we're going to look at today. And so to uh, help us think about this a little bit uh, and to remember that we have three main adversaries as believers in Christ, three main adversaries in our, in our life, and it's the world, it's the flesh, and it's the devil. The world, not this, the creation, beautiful as it is. Yes, the, yes, the creation can be uh, pretty angry at times, right? Hurricanes, storms, flooding, lots of ways, but not that, but the world in the evil fallen world system, the things that draw our heart away from the living God, it's our enemy. The world, the flesh, our fallen nature, our, our penchant to constantly go back to the things of the world to be drawn away from our first love, which should be Christ. The world, the flesh, but then the devil. The reality is that we have spiritual adversary fighting against us. And uh, as we'll see as we go along here today, he is a conquered adversary, but nonetheless very strong and very powerful ultimately who will be utterly vanquished and cast into hell but that day has not yet come and so we want to look at this a little bit the topic of spiritual warfare it's it's quite vast but we're going to focus in four different texts in ephesians and so if you want to turn to chapter one i'll, I'll work with the wind as i go along here today and we'll we'll see what we can do so to remind ourselves of a few things uh regarding spiritual the uh, uh, spiritual forces, both holy angels and fallen. Holy angels and fallen. For instance, uh, they're brilliant, but they're not all-knowing. Sometimes we give uh, Satan and his forces more credit than he's due. Brilliant, far beyond our capacity, but not all-knowing. He's not God. Uh, so, so they're brilliant, but they're not all-knowing. There's many things they don't know. They possess incredible power, but they're not all-powerful. Only God is all-powerful. Uh, they're limited in the exercise of their power by the will of God. It's by the will of the living God that they exist and move and have their being just as the rest of creation. And so our letter, as we look at this here today, we're going to see that uh, they're learning. Angels are learning right along with us because there's so much that they do not know. And so they, they learn as we learn, learn. They're spirit beings created by an all-knowing, all-powerful, all, power, all everywhere-present pre God. They live and serve at his pleasure. They have great power, but they're nothing compared to God. Keep that in mind as we go along. So then this includes Satan and the demonic hosts as well. And one question that immediately surfaces is where did Satan come from? You read Genesis chapter 3, and the serpent just shows up to tempt Eve. And, and, and the only thing that we get there is that he's very crafty. And so there's no explanation given there. And uh, to be honest, Scripture is not utterly clear. There are a passage in Ezekiel 28 and in Isaiah 14. We're not going to go there. But theologians believe because uh, in those texts, the writer uh, is uh, talking about a king but then the language goes to such a height that it can't apply to a mere man. 
And so the theologians believe that there's an explanation of the fall of Satan from, from uh, his position. And the belief is that uh, uh, Satan himself was created as a holy angel, stood right next to God himself, had a high and lofty position, was possessed by pride of position and beauty, and wanted, to be honest, the very place of God himself, and the Lord cast him out of heaven for it. That's where we believe Satan came from. And so ever since, uh, and along with him, along with Satan, probably up to a third of the angels of heaven rebelled with him. Cast out of heaven from the direct presence of God, cast to the earth, which is the domain then of Satan. And in, in, in that then, he, there's been this war and animosity between the forces of Satan and of the living God ever since. But remember... God is the one who rules as we go along here. So there, Satan and his hosts are very powerful. But as one uh, commentator put it, angels cannot do those things that are peculiar to deity. They can't do the things that only deity can do. They cannot create. They cannot act without means. In other words, there has to be something for them to act with. And they cannot search the human heart. In other words, Satan's ability to appear as a man, read Genesis 6, cause false miracles, think of the Egyptian magicians with Moses, all of that, it's predicated on twisting material and reality as God has made it. So no out of nothing creating. Remember God, he spoke and everything that is came into being. Only God can do that. Satan takes existing materials and twists it. He cannot create. So everything that Satan does comes from a lie. No out of nothing creating, as I said. Uh, Jesus said, talking about Satan in John 8, there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. Fallen angels can't tempt. They, can't, uh, they cannot tempt, twist, or distort, or create without there first being a truth or material to tempt, twist, or distort with. In other words, they're limited. Incredibly powerful, but very limited as well. And lastly, only God sees this, the human heart. Satan and the demonic realm are brilliant. They have experience of thousands of years. So they're very good at leveraging our weaknesses and can anticipate our responses and what we're going to do. But they can't know the unrevealed future, and they can't know human thoughts that only God holds in his hand. Sometimes uh, we can underrate or undervalue our enemy, and at the same time, we can give him more credit than what he's due. That's kind of the point here. So here's the warning from Peter before we dive into Ephesians. Here's the warning from Peter. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. His goal is your destruction. If you're a believer in Christ, you cannot be separated from Christ, but he will drag you down and demoralize you and debase you as far as he possibly can if we allow him to. He is our adversary. And yet, he's very good at taking the truth even and distorting it and leading us astray with the very word of God. As, uh, this is Erwin Lutzer. I would commend his book to you. Um, I, I got mine. Okay, I'm old, but I bought my copy back in 1996. It was re-released in 2015, called The Serpent of Paradise. But in uh, 2015, re-released as God's Devil. God's Devil by Erwin Lutzer. Very good. R.C. Sproul said that's the finest work I've ever read on the person and work of our adversary, uh, God's Devil by Erwin Lutzer. And Lutzer says this, Satan's desire is to get us to choose to sin even while pointing to a verse in an open Bible. The notion that Satan always says evil things is simply not true. He can quote God's word. He can even mouth doctrine. He'll come as close to the truth as he possibly can in order to deceive, manipulate, and lay a religious trap for his intended victims. And some of his lies are perilously close to the truth. Turn on, your, uh, uh, turn on your Christian TV stations and radio programs and all the rest, and you hear a lot of exactly what Lutzer's talking about there. Perilously close to the truth to deceive people and lead them down the primrose path. So let's look at Ephesians then. 
and we're going to look at uh, the the powers and forces in in heavenly places. So in Ephesians chapter one is where we're going to start in verse twenty. And uh, as as we, I'm going to start reading in verse eighteen. I pray we, this has already been preached, but I wanted to draw out from from here the interaction with spiritual forces. So I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. One thing I wanted to point out right away is, is you'll see in these passages we're going to look at some form of this rule, authority, power, and dominion. He's speaking of spiritual forces in, in, in heavenly places. Now, it's interesting. Some theologians try to break that down and discern what the difference is between rule and authority, power and dominion. It's not our our purpose here to do that, other than to mention the fact that there does seem to be a hierarchy Uh, in the angelic realm, both holy angels and fallen, that there's a hierarchy. Satan himself rules over the demonic realm, it seems. And even in the holy angels, there seem to be those who, uh, in a hierarchical uh, standpoint, seem to have position over the other angels. But in this particular text, just to, uh, by way of review, there's three foundational truths that Paul gives here in regard to the Lord in verse uh, 18 and 19. He says, uh, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. And there's three things. So you will know the hope of his calling, three foundational truths, the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and the surpassing greatness of of his power toward us who believe. Look at that, hope of his calling, the calling in Christ uh, into, into relationship with him, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, all that the blood of Christ bought us so that we could ha- enter relationship with the living God, and then the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe, not only to defeat the forces of Satan, but most of all, to pay the penalty for sin and satisfy the just wrath of a holy father in the atonement. It's an incredible thing that Christ accomplished that there. And he says this is in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, the unsurpassing power of Father God. And he, the Father, raised Jesus from the dead. Something that's never, this is not just brought back to life like Lazarus, which was an incredible miracle when Jesus did that, remember? Lazarus come forth, dead man is living. No, but this is raised to newness of life. Jesus Christ has a resurrection body still today somewhere out there wherever the presence of the Father is. There is Jesus Christ, the man, with a resurrection body. This is a whole different level of resurrection, and he's seated at the Father's right hand in heavenly places there in verse 20. And so my point here is the exalted position of Christ, seated in heavenly places. It appears that there are levels or planes of existence such that the heavens can be perceived as the space above the earth. We look up, we see the sky and the clouds. The planes may fly over. We see the birds flying in the heavens. But then the heavens can be perceived as the, uh, the planets, the outer space, Uh, all uh, to the farthest planet away, the universe, the heavens. But then at another level, the heavens can be perceived as that place where God's presence is immediately manifested and where Jesus is and uh, where God's presence is openly expressed and and felt. And so Jesus is seated in the highest heavens, right next to the Father. That's where Christ existed, exists. And so the resurrected Christ is seated in that position in power. And so all authority 
and power and dominion and every name that it, that is named. And it means Christ is elevated to a position that gives him unquestioned authority in all times, all places, over all things. And so all beings, all matter, all things are put into subjection to Christ. Paul tells us, last year we, we studied this together, but Paul tells us over there in Colossians chapter 1, by him, Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Do you get the picture? Jesus Christ is exalted above everything, and everything, including matter itself, bows to his will. Paul makes clear in that uh, Colossians passage that even the universe itself clings together because he wills it to, to be so. And so you remember Matthew 28, Great Commission. And Jesus, uh, in uh, 28, 18, is, is he, he had sent his men ahead to an appointed place. He's going to ascend to heaven. And in his final words to him, it says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All means all. Jesus Christ is Lord of everything. Of course, in that then, he goes on in the Great Commission and in his position of all authority, he tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so the commandment to go and to win and to preach the gospel comes from the Lord who is exalted to a position above everything. So the exalted position of Christ. Number two then, as I battle my pages, is uh, the mystery of Christ, the church, and the Gentiles. Look at chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. This is a mystery. This is where I say the angels are learning right along with us, and this includes uh, Satan and his host, totally caught off guard. So in, in the Ephesians chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 8, to me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, so that even through the church, rulers and authorities in heavenly places would see what God is doing. Think of it. You see the angels, this... Uh, the Holy Spirit comes upon a virgin over there in Judea, and what in the world is this about where the, the Spirit of God unites with human flesh? And what in the world is going on here? And the angels are, this is a mystery. What's God doing here? And this baby uh, it, with nine months grows in the mother's womb and is born in the normal human ways and raised as a child to manhood. What in the world is God doing as God has united with human flesh and we have the God-man? And then this God-man in his ministry is preaching and teaching and, and, and ultimately brutally killed. What in the world is God doing? They killed him. And the angels are longing to look into these things, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1, verse 12, it was revealed to them, the prophets, that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look, even, even the angels fallen and holy. They're wondering what it is that God is up to and they're learning. Paul says we speak God's wisdom in a mystery 
the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. And as he reveals here in, in Ephesians, the great mystery is that God is not only calling a people out from a pagan named Abraham, follow me, I'll make of you a great nation. And for almost 2,000 years, he talked primarily to Abraham's family. And then at the incarnation, all of a the sudden, there's an explosion in the whole, the whole world. All of humanity, the gospel call goes out, and all of us are called to come to Christ. It's an amazing thing. Well, he goes on there in that passage, so that the manifold, the, the multifaceted, varicated, unknown wisdom of God is put on display for all to see. Specifically, though, to those rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Remember, if Satan was a holy angel and he fell because he thought that he was wonderful and beautiful and I want the power that God, God has, God is slowly, incrementally, little by little, showing him that he's nothing. God has a plan. And Satan will be overcome. And Satan will be defeated. And, and he's finding that his doom is sure. Remember Mountain. Martin Luther's song mighty fortress is our God and the doom of Satan shows up even in that song one little word will fell him Luther says in that song it's an amazing thing and so the mystery of Christ the church and the Gentiles is an astounding thing to all the heavenly forces number three the victory The victory of Christ over all authorities. Sorry, but I'm battling wind a little bit if you haven't noticed. We're getting there, though. The victory of Christ over all authorities. This is chapter 4, verse 7. Chapter 4, verse 7. But to each one of us, and we've, we've looked at this passage, each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except that they also had descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also him Himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The Christ who descended to the lowest parts of the earth is the same one who after his resurrection ascended into the highest uh, places of heaven that he might fill all things. So therefore it says when he ascended on high, my pages are blowing away. how you lay a plan and you think it's going to work and then it doesn't? Sorry. My fault. Therefore, when he ascended on high, he led, he led captive, a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And the parallel passage over in Colossians is very interesting. Paul talked about this same thing. And last year when we went through Colossians, we studied this. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, Colossians 2.15, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. And so Jesus, when he ascended on high, he led host uh, captive a host of of captives. This is a picture of, uh, during the Roman Republic of that day, the triumphal march. It's very interesting. Um, when, when armies, when they, when they achieved great victories, there would be marches, particularly the, some of the, the, the great battles where the generals would be allowed to march through the city with their forces. And the Senate and others would be there to review the troops when they march past. And the, the people are out in droves to cheer them on. But as they did that, following immediately behind the conquering general would be some of the generals and troops from the uh, defeated forces who would be marched out uh, in front of the people. 
and so they would march him past, and, and you, can, you can hear the people all calling out and cat calling and all the rest of the stuff that goes along with it. And, and, and uh, the scorn, to the scorn of the crowds, and then, then captured items, gold and jewels and other things that, that were captured, are paraded before the people, and then there's a citywide party for, that would last for days. Uh, banquets and gifts and just a celebration. And then uh, uh, most of that booty would go to the Roman state, but the general himself would be enriched then, and many of them would retire and were viewed almost as gods to the Roman people. And it's, it's, a, it's a picture of the conquering general. It's interesting. We believe Paul wrote Ephesians probably in uh, A.D. 61, just 10 years from now. A.D. 71, Titus Vespasian will have a, a march through Rome after crushing the Jews, defeating uh, Judah, and destroying Jerusalem. And you go to Rome today, and there's a triumphal arch. The Arch of Titus is there. And it uh, commemorates Titus's victories there in uh, Palestine when they suppressed the Jews. Well, this is uh, the imagery, then, of what Paul is talking about here. Satan has been put on display. The the, when Christ marched in triumph, he defeated our enemy Satan and all his demonic hosts. Never did the forces of darkness see this coming. Satan, it seems, actually thought that he had gained the upper hand in the death of Christ. We've defeated him. And all this talk of being a substitute and a savior laid to rest in a rich man's tomb, and there he is. <laughs> but he didn't stay dead. He walked out of the grave. And when he walked out of the grave, there's a multitude of things that happened in the same moment of time. At the instant that Jesus Christ walked out of the grave, the wrath of the Father is satisfied. There'd finally been supplied a sacrifice that would satisfy the holy and just requirements of the Father. And, and our sin is atoned and paid for. No more wrath for those who belong to Christ. But second, at the same time, all the forces of darkness were put on notice. They're defeated, and their final doom is sure. It's coming because Christ had publicly, listen, and at the point of his greatest humiliation, naked on a cross, at that point, he overcame the sting of death, satisfied the just wrath of his Father and humiliated all of Satan's forces in front of all of creation. Praise God. The gospel and what he did in the crushing of the serpent's head. And so I, I would say to you, those that are gathered, if you're watching this online, You can have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. You can know God as Father. You can be at peace. You can learn to walk in victory over Satan and the demonic realm because of the victory that Christ won. As we've seen, Jesus is in the highest position. He's creator God, Lord of all that is. Nothing moves outside of his will and he himself paid the penalty for our sin and he wants to be your savior as well so with his own blood he paid that penalty and he defeated all of his enemies and according to Hebrews 1 3 he sat down at the right hand of the father on high because his work is done and now he's ruling please don't delay commit yourself to Christ today we'd love to be able to explain to you how you too can know him. Well, lastly, chapter 6, verse 10. This is for us because Satan is a real enemy and he's alive and well on planet earth and we battle him every day. Remember the world, the flesh, and the devil. Today specifically we're talking about our battle with the satanic realm. And so finally, verse 10 of Ephesians 6, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, 
against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly realms. Our world is not against, or our, our, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against who's going to be president after the next election. That's not our battle. Our battle is not against other issues that we face. They're important. We should be involved, but that's not our battle. Our battle is against spiritual forces in high places. And so Paul says, be strong, be empowered, be enabled. How? In the Lord and in the strength of his might. The vigor, the dominion, the power of his might, the same might that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead is available to us to be able to walk in holiness and newness of life because of Christ. Over there in 1 Corinthians, this is Paul again, speaking uh, similarly, 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 14, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in, in love. That phrase, act like men, it has the idea of courage and strength under duress. If you uh, interesting to me, the NIV 84 interprets or translates that act like men. In the latest NIV, they've changed it to courageous because in that passage, Paul is talking to all of us, men and women. And so it seems unusual he would say act like men to the women, but he's trying to put his finger on something here. The only other places there's two other places in our bible where that phrase or a very similar phrase act like men is used and both of them are in the old testament both of them are to men in warfare and both of them one of them is the philistines even and in that case there's uh, uh, the case of the philistines the ark has come into the camp all of the jews are are uh, they're celebrating because god's in our midst and we're going to go out and win and the the philistines are said we're done we're going to be destroyed. And the call goes out, act like men, get up and fight. And he's calling for manly courage in the face of duress and stress, battlefield where they're called to muster courage and fully engage the fight. And so he's saying to all of us, both men and women, don't cower in fear. Jesus has already won the fight. We live in the victory that that. Christ has won. So this isn't a pick yourself up by your own bootstraps, you know, suck it up. We need to remember the words of Jesus. John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. That includes in our battle against uh, the satanic realm, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. That's why he says, put on the full armor of God. Uh, Andy will be uh, working on that with us on August 4th, Lord willing. And so we won't go into that, uh, what the armor of God is. But he says, put on the full armor, the old word panoply. There's one that uh, surfaced when I was looking at that. But what it, what it literally means is put on all of the armor, every piece. There's a reason so that you'll be able to stand, that is, abide or continue. There's a fixedness to it, a determination to stand against the schemes, the wiles, or the lying in wait. We have an enemy who seeks to destroy, as Peter already warned us. Back in chapter 2 of Ephesians, you go to chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, he is for you. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Satan is the prince of the power of the air, and this earth is his domain. Yes, he's a defeated enemy, but he's still very, very powerful. This is his domain. Paul says there in Ephesians 6.12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We're not battling flesh and blood. We're battling against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. 
Remember, this is a spiritual battle against an invisible enemy who possesses incredible power, but he's not God. Our power to over, overcome comes from Jesus always and only through his blood. When we face all the forces of evil and of wickedness, we claim the blood of Christ. That's our defense. So we see in this book of Ephesians, in these four examples where Paul is drawing out the fact that even in our supposed adversity with other people, bottom of it all, it's a spiritual battle. And there's a battle for the souls of men and women, and we have an enemy who wants our destruction. So there's three things I want you to remember. Number one, remember that Jesus is exalted above all things. This is a big deal. Nothing and no one are in a higher position of power and authority. It's very interesting. Just before Jesus was crucified, this is this, this, seemingly a small detail, but it tells us something significant. So in Luke 22, he's talking to Peter. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your, pray, that your faith may not fail in you, and once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. It's very interesting there. Simon, Simon, Satan has uh, asked to sift you like wheat, and we know that he did. Because it's only going to be just a few hours from now, and Satan's going to deny he even knows Jesus with a curse. And he's going to be sifted. But the resurrected Christ is going to restore Peter. And he's going to strengthen his brothers, and he's going to be used powerfully in the foundation of the infant church. And what I want us to see, there's a lot of truths there to to, uh, draw out of that uh, passage, but the thing I want to see is that Satan asked, I want to attack Peter, sift him like wheat, and God said, go ahead, but he set a parameter, he set limits, because I've still got work for Peter to do. Read Job first couple chapters of Job and all the horrible things that happened to Job and you know you find out it was Satan himself that asked to do that God gave him permission but he said you can't take his life you can take his family you can take his health you can take his wealth you can't have his life see because God is in control Jesus is above all things so Puritan William Gurnall that's what he said about Satan when God says stay Satan must stand like a dog by the table. While the saints feast on God's comfort, he does not dare to even snatch a tidbit, for the master's eye is always on him, and it's true. Satan is a powerful, powerful being. Jesus Christ crushed him when he walked out of the grave. Number two, remember in his victory over death, Jesus also defeated all the forces of sin, death, and hell. We don't need to any longer live in fear and subjection to Satan. He's powerful, but defeated. Here's a sentence. If we properly fear God, we don't need to fear anything else. We fear God. Number three, in our standing against the enemy, we need to remember that Jesus has already won the fight, so it's not our battle. It is not our battle. It's, it's a lot like Judah. Remember Jehoshaphat? Enemy forces are coming up, and, and they're going to be overwhelmed. They're going to be crushed. And Jehoshaphat goes to God, and he says, Lord, we don't know what to do, but we're looking to you. And God says in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 15, Listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. And you read that account, it's incredible what God did there. My point is simply, in our battle with sin and death and hell, it's not our fight. God's already won it. And the omnipotent Christ is already in control. 
and he's given us everything we need to fight our enemy. And so uh, when Paul goes on in chapter 6 and talks about the armor, which Andy will do with us in just a few weeks, we're going to find out some of the things that the Lord has given us to help us to overcome in our lives. And uh, so we can suffice it to say that we have all the resources of the all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present God. We got it all, every bit of it. Because our brother, our big brother Jesus, won the fight for us. So here's the closing words that I would, would give to us. This, this is Paul. Closing out the book of Romans, chapter 16, verse 20. He says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <laughs> what a privilege to call you Father, to come into your very presence. Lord, we realize that we have strong and powerful enemies that oppose us. And Lord, some of us face great battles in spiritual places, all of us at times. Lord, the temptations that we struggle with, the, the literal attack of spiritual forces that cloud our minds and our memories and, and our bodies. And Lord, these are not things to be trifled with, but we, we realize that you, the omnipotent God, through the through Christ have defeated all of the forces of darkness. And Lord, that you rule as the most high God. So Lord, we worship you today. We ask you, Lord, to constantly remind us. Remind us of the fact of what you have done. Remind us of the security that we have in Christ. Remind us that we're not enough, but you are. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the blood of Christ and the salvation that he bought for us. Lord, we just want to say we love you. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I have one more text I want to read for you, and then I'm, then I'm out of here. It's Revelation 20. We, lo <clears throat> we long for this day. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Never forget that in hell itself, Satan is not the tormentor. He's chief among those who will be tormented. He lost. <laughs>